Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to the Culinary Medicine uh, Show. I'm Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you again for Chef AJ for having me on her YouTube channel. It's always such a privilege and uh, honor to be on Chef AJ's channel, and it's always fun to do these. For this week, we are in uh, the first weekend of uh, March, one of my favorite months because it's my birthday month. And it always signifies, you know, something, you know, kind of like season changes, you know, the seasons changing, depending on where you are in the country, we've been having all kinds of crazy weather. So, you know, definitely looking forward to some change. So for today's show, um, I will not be doing a demo. I'm actually going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, and that's eating mindfully. And I think no matter where you are in the spectrum, whether you are a omnivore or whole food plant-based, um, SOS-free to vegan, and anywhere in between, I think it's very, very important to understand what eating mindfully means. And I'm going to go in depth with this. And I think you're going to find a lot of great uh, tips and insights. And definitely stay tuned uh, to the end of the presentation. And I'm going to leave a surprise for you guys uh, for watching till the end. So we're going to try to target 30 to 45 minutes, depending on how fast I talk. I'm originally from New Jersey, so I tend to talk really fast. And in case you know, you need to go and set your timer on your Instapot, you know, so you have an idea. So without further ado, I'm going to put up my slide. So here we go. So the name of my presentation is Eating Mindfully in Today's World. And so when you look at uh, a picture like this, you know, what do you, you know, see, right? We have the family table, right? We have a lot of smiles. We have a lot of laughter. We have a lot of togetherness, right? And, you know, if you think about it, you know, how many of this, you know, do you have in your own, you know, how many, how many family dinners or family, you know, togetherness and meals do you have, you know, per month, right? You know, do you have it during holidays? Do you have it once per week? Do you have her every day? Does this look more like reality? You know, you have in you know, upper left hand corner, you have everyone on a screen or a smart device. You have upper right hand corner, you have, you know, eating while you're working, lower right, you're, you know, eating, you know, while you're driving. I had one time where I was at a traffic light and, you know, the, the lady next to me was putting on her makeup at the traffic light and I think putting on her business clothes and I don't know how females do it, but it's truly incredible. So anyway, how many, how many of this looks like your current, you know, environment? So the question I would like to um, invite uh, to ask is, does it feel like we have outsourced our food and our experience with food? With the advent of the pandemic, you know, app deliveries, food deliveries, using these smart uh, device apps has made it super, super convenient in delivering not just groceries, but everyday products, as well as uh, takeout and food. And I think that has been great while, you know, during the brunt of the pandemic, you know, we've been sequestered and we couldn't really go out, right? But, you know, over time, you know, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, deliveries will always be a thing. And, and it's important to understand, you know, what is a trade-off? There's a cost to everything. So I'm going to relay some uh, stats for you guys. So, you know, just in the context of TV dinners, TV dinners has been around since uh, I would say, you know, t uh, the end of World War II, where America has faced, you know, kind of like a flourishing uh, of sorts and kind of like a food revolution of sorts. You know, um, over time, it's grown. Yeah, um, the Nutrition Business Journal showed a lot of great, you know, natural and organic frozen dinners has steadily um, been growing 10 to 14 percent per year since 1997. 2001, consumers have spent three 380 million on them, and I'm sure it's grown since then. In terms of frozen meals, uh, 72, you know, per year, making it a 22 billion dollar industry. So what do you actually, you know, get, right? So, you know, as we all know, you know, McDonald's has been one of the most popular fast food chains. And why is that, right? Well, back in the day, drive-in restaurants started in the 1940s. And it actually, you know, believe it or not, it didn't start with McDonald's. I believe Sonic was one of the original uh, fast food joints. But the McDonald brothers did invent the speedy service system, okay? And what that means is that you don't have to have short 
order cooks. And short order cooks is basically, you know, a line cook that you teach a few, you know, techniques, you know, to prepare, you know, a portion of a meal. And then uh, you gather that meal together and then you deliver it, right? You know, when you don't have short order cooks, what that means is that you're teaching one solitary technique to someone and they're just doing that over and over again, whether they're flipping, you know, you know, a bread um, buns over or beef patties or frying fries, right? And so, you know, they developed the system where they have created speed, automation, and consistency. So that that is the reason why you're able to eat McDonald's and taste exactly the same in Kansas versus if you take eat McDonald's in Shanghai. It's basically, you know, exactly the same thing. And they were really good at it, hence why McDonald's has been thriving over the decades. But what do you exactly get with a Happy Meal? Well, you know, you're higher in fat, lower in fiber, right? This isn't news for our, you know, audience at Chef AJ. You know, you're eating, ingesting a, a, a lot more calories, right? We teach the concepts of calorie density versus nutritional density, right? Higher in sugar, salt, trans fat, portion sizes, right? For those of you that has 7-Elevens, you know, you have the big gulp right? And it comes with addictive qualities. You know, Chef AJ talks about this a lot over time, as well as her esteemed guests. And over time, it actually changes our taste bud where sometimes I have, you know, patients that come up to me and say, you know, what does that mean? You know, when I try to you know, ask my patients, you know, can you taper off of soda, right? Or Diet Coke, you know, with water. I try to be able to exchange that, you know, they don't like it because, you know, they said that doc, I don't enjoy it because I can't taste water, right? Which is odd to me because water has no taste, right? And then over time, you hear about the reports of salmonella, E. coli, not just in fast food, like Jack in a Box, which originally got famous for this issue, but also things like lettuce, salad greens, Things like that. And that's because a lot of the, you know, vegetable gardens and agricultural fields and that produce mass, you know, lands for uh, produce are right next to uh, CAFOs and that's concentrated animal feeding operations. So what is the impact? So back to my original slide where, you know, we're outsourcing, what do we mean by that? And what do I mean by that is, you know, when you're outsourcing, you're not preparing meals within your own kitchen. And that's where your health, you know, begins, right? So, you know, you want to be able to, you want to be able to know what goes into your food. You want to be able to know that, you know, what goes into the ingredients that you come up with, right? When you outsource, outsourcing is anything outside of the household. So this could be in the form of restaurants, takes out, fast food, delivery, uh, what have you, right? So there's a cost to this. You know, from 1970 to 2012, 25.9% of all food spending was outside the home. And in 2012, it went up to 43%. And a lot of that has uh, been due to the shifting of the home unit, uh, where a larger share of women has been employed outside the home, becoming more of a two earning um, household, um, higher incomes, which makes fast food more affordable and convenience items. Also, advertising was increasing. Between 1977 and 2008, uh, the total amount of calories from food has risen from 18 to 32% from outside. So home food preparation, as you can see uh, from 1965 to 2007, it actually has decreased 23% in 40 years. And, you know, eating away from home uh, from 1970 to 2010, that has increased 42%. And eating out is not that great, right? So when you're outsourcing, you're essentially, what you're doing is that, you know, you're letting others handle your food. And guess what? They're not you know, paying attention to your health or paying attention to the bottom line. So dining out, you know, is unhealthy. Restaurant food has more fat, cholesterol, sodium, calories than your home cooked meals. And eating out is actually more expensive with the equivalent of $22 of a takeout meal, which can cost $12 to make at home. Right. So there's always a trade off. And at the same time, when they're talk when we're talking about the bottom line, what we're doing is that we're trying to cut corners, right? In order to make that same product, you know, the cheapest as possible. But at the same time, they're not looking at your health. And so we need to be able to weigh weigh those options uh, as much as possible. So what about cooking trends? So is cooking at home associated with better diet quality or um, or weight loss intention? 
And there's different uh, studies that show that when people cook more of their meals at home, they consume fewer calories, less sugar and less fat than those uh, who cook less or not at all. And those who frequently cooked at home upwards of six to seven nights a week, they consumed fewer calories on occasions when they ate out. So there are a lot of um, studies that show the correlation with cooking and obesity. We find that lower rates of obesity are observed in countries where individuals spend more time preparing their own foods. What they found with the French and Italian adults, they spend 19 more minutes per day cooking than Americans and have lower rates of obesity. British adults spend almost exactly the same amount of time cooking as Americans and actually have comparable rates of obesity. So when you're looking at cooking and health and mortality, you know, there's an inverse correlation between it. So what that means is that if you spend more time in terms of frequency of cooking per week, we are decreasing the rates of death. So for those of you who don't know me, you know, again, my name is Dr. Colin Zoom. And, you know, just to, you know, why do I give this talk and who am I? If you haven't been following any of the previous sessions or haven't heard from anything from me before. I'm originally from New Jersey. I'm a first generation immigrant child. I'm board certified in family and lifestyle medicine. And, you know, I went through a period of going through medical school like everyone else and found out really quickly that, you know, nutrition, lifestyle, and food was not talked about at school. And why that was curious for me and why that played a huge role was that no matter who can walk through our doors, whether it's, you know, someone that complained of cough or low back pain, there was always some sort of chronic lifestyle related risk factor attached to them. High blood pressure, you know, carrying extra weight, diabetes, cancer, you name it, I'm sure you either uh, battle it yourself or you know of someone uh, that does. And so what I did was that I took it upon myself to make a lot of detours. I graduated from a plant-based health supportive culinary school called the Natural Gourmet Institute. This was back in 2011, 2012. It had since you know, got acquired by uh, the Institute of Culinary Education. I got certified also in health coaching. And you know, from this, I you know, recognized more and more and more the interconnection between food, health, and community. And uh, since since then, I've dedicated my professional career to teaching others, not only in terms of uh, food as medicine, but also what are what are the aspects, the characteristics, what are the components of learning how to thrive as well. So why did I cook and why did I, you know, why, what did I learn about food? So my culinary experiences, you know, I was really blessed that um, both of my parents cooked growing up. You know, not many people can say that, you know, a lot of people that end up cooking, you know, either learn from their parents or their grandparents. And, you know, like I mentioned before, I wanted to learn more about food and where it came from, not just about nutrition. Um, I wanted to learn um, how food was sourced, how it was plated, you know, what did it took, you know, to grow, you know, certain uh, produce, what did, you know, food agriculture, um, you know, was like, and how did, you know, what that process was in terms of how it arrived to your plate. The Natural Gourmet Institute gave me more opportunities to grow uh, my plant-based lexicon. And I also interned at a one Michelin starred Indian restaurant, and I started giving culinary medicine workshops since 2016. So what is culinary medicine? So culinary medicine is a newer um, evidence-based uh, field of medicine that blends the art of food and cooking with the science of medicine to optimize someone's uh, health. It's utilizing the unique combination of nutrition and culinary knowledge and assisting these patients. And so what's interesting is that, you know, when you're looking at home cooking, you know, there's a lot of barriers and facilitators, you know, uh, common things, you know, that I get, you know, with transitioning to eating more plants is that it's expensive. It takes a lot of time. Um, I don't have resources, things like that. Surveys have shown that barriers would be, you know, uh, low confidence, low lack of skills and limited time. And facilitators is that, you know, if we get a little bit more organized, if we plan correctly and we focus focused on actually enjoying food, it actually would make are these behavior changes in terms of cooking for ourselves in the kitchen more sustainable. And I always encourage my patients to be able to cook, not just for yourselves, you know, because everyone has a different reason for cooking for themselves, but also cooking it in conjunction with others. A shared meal goes a long way. It enhances our relationships, our interpersonal connections, and reinforces relationships, which are, you know, one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. So the concepts we teach is uh, batch cooking, meal prep, which is the bulk of time as opposed to just, you know, cooking. We also use kitchen appliances to cook while you're not cooking. 
And we teach the concepts of repurposing, storing, freezing, using leftovers, and portion control. And this is some of the concepts that I teach to my patients. Shopping along the perimeter of a supermarket because a supermarket is very, very strategic. Shopping for live produce and bulk foods. Learning how to read a nutrition label and, you know, being able to pronounce it and looking for the fewest ingredients as possible. Shopping in uh, local ethnic markets, farmers markets, and wholesale clubs to be able to reduce costs and understanding that that not everything needs to be organic. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty of today's topic, and that's eating mindfully. So what does food mean to you? And what does food mean to your patients? If, you know, those of us that are healthcare professionals that are watching this, right? Food means something different for everyone. Food is, you know, very, you know, it, it's, it's always showing affection. It's always showing a good time. It's for celebration. For others, it could be very emotional. For others, it's very political. Uh, food can be very, you know, uh, financial. And it's a universal language, kind of like music, arts, dance, singing. And so it, you know, it means something for all of us. And it's a form of expression as well. So what does it mean to eat mindlessly? All right. It happens when one is not paying attention to how hungry they are, how much they're eating or why they're even eating. It's associated with overeating and eating less healthy food. And this happens when we're distracted by something else like social media, streaming TV, or TV dinner companions. So it doesn't matter whether we are, you know, vegan or whole food plant-based SOS or an omnivore, eating mindlessly is not the best thing for us. You know, we will distract ourselves and we don't even get to enjoy the food uh, in front of us. And I would bet that, you know, it's important to, you know, value what you are eating or what your loved one is delivering for you instead of just mindlessly eating in front of a TV and not even paying attention to what's in front of you. So let's relate this to what it means in terms of medical health and costs. So these are 2017-2018 NHANES uh, obesity data. Nearly one in three adults are overweight, so that's around 31%. More than two in five um, have obesity, and one in 11 have severe obesity. And this presents a economic burden. You know, we're going to take uh, obesity as a, an example. In 2014, the global economic impact of obesity was estimated to be uh, $2 trillion or 2.8 of the global gross domestic product. In America uh, it's, uh, itself, you know, we, we spend up to 20% of our gross domestic, domestic product. And Unfortunately, out of all the westernized uh, uh, societies, we're actually lowest in terms of health um, outcomes. This also presents indirect costs of production loss, loss of work days, mortality, and permanent disability. So what does mindfulness mean? Well, it's the act of focusing on the present moment and accepting bodily sensation, thoughts, and feelings and experience in that moment. How many of you guys practice mindfulness, you know, at home or some sort of, you know, mindfulness based practice, breathing, yoga, meditation, or anything related to that? Okay. So, so that's important. And I'm glad that you do. So what are the principles of it? Well, it's cultivating the possibility of freeing yourself of reactive habitual patterns of thinking, feeling, and acting. And it's the point of it is to promote more balance, choice, wisdom, and acceptance of what is. Now, when you combine that with eating, right, you get mindful eating. And this occurs when you can use all of your senses and you're able to appreciate the food that you're eating and paying attention to one's own hunger cues. So how do you prevent mindless eating? Well, one of the things is, is that you want to avoid distractions. You want to avoid grazing, right? You want to minimize indulgences. If you are vegan, you can easily just indulge a whole bunch of vegan junk food, right? You can eat a whole bunch. You can just eat Twinkie and Oreos all day long and call yourself a vegan. It's, you know, you have to be mindful of what's going into your system. How do we continue to prevent it? Smaller portions, eating slowly and chewing uh, thoroughly. Okay. And understanding what is physical hunger, okay, versus emotional hunger and finding non-food ways to cope. 
And then this is also important to note is that we always have our internal judge, right? That internal critic that we have inside of all of us, okay? And there's always going to be some sort of voice, some sort of finger pointing that's going to say, you know, you're packing on too much or you look too thin or you don't look good in this dress or, you know, there's always going to be some sort of judgment. And I definitely want you to be very mindful um, of that to give yourself grace, to give yourself patience. And, you know, if it's, you're not able to accomplish your food slash health slash wellness goals for today, there's always tomorrow, you know what I'm saying? So don't beat yourself up. So if you're battling with food um, restriction, you know, just understand that both physical and mental triggers, it, what it means is that it triggers a loss of control, right? And it's important to find kind ways to comfort, nurture, and resolve emotional issues, right? Emotions such as anxiety, boredom, loneliness, and anger all can have triggers that food cannot fix, right? And all bodies deserve dignity. How many of you that either battle or know of someone that battles with anxiety, depression, some form of addiction, you know, you know, how many of you just raise your hand? So, you know, there's a lot of trauma um, that we have faced, you know, over time. I say this a lot, you know, over the past is saying that, you know, to be human is also to experience, you know, trauma as well, because life is very stressful, you know, and stress kind of like taxes is unavoidable, right? But one of my fan analogies is, you know, it's kind of like I'm located in Southern California, you know, so I'm going to use a surfing analogy. So life is you know, life challenges, they come in form of obstacles and they're like tidal waves, right? You can have small waves, you can have large waves, right? And they're always going to be coming. So life is really about, you know, surfing that surfboard and you're going to be knocked off of that surfboard, right? But it's important to know that, you know, you get back up on that surfboard more times than you fall down. But don't do it just with yourself, you know, doing it with in a support of a community like Chef AJ's channel, you know, she has a great, you know, community that she's built over time, as well as having a support person, whether it's a therapist, a coach, a counselor, okay, it's important to have this. And, you know, I think that one of the positives that, you know, COVID has done has brought mental health up to the surface. But there's some things that food cannot fix, right? It's there for sustenance, it's there for nourishment, Okay, it's there for us to function, right? But it's not going to be able to fix a lot of, you know, what, you know, what we're trying to cope with, with our emotions. Uh, okay, so how do we practice mindful eating? Well, one is you want to have a designated eating area. So what that means is that if you can find a designated area where, you know, you're, you know, not in front of a TV, awesome. Okay. Have something where you're not distracted. Focus on eating and avoiding distractions, avoiding judgment of your reactions to the food. Okay. And take small bites and chew slowly and thoroughly. And then there's, um, if you ever study the blue zones, the Okinawans, uh, they say something called hara hachibu. And this is what this means is that it's a saying that they say to yourself before eating. And in Japanese, it translates to eat when you're about 40, 80% full. And one of my favorite things about cooking, especially cooking at home, is that, you know, it allows me to use all of my five senses. And it's important as a chef, um, as a cook, as someone that's in the kitchen to use all of your five senses, okay, to know how the meal is coming together, to understanding when, you know, on, what's going on on the stovetop, to if there's going to be an emergency, to act quickly. So you need to use all of your five senses. So, you know, cooking is a great way to honing into that. You know, there's also a literature review on mindful based eating, and there's actually mindful based eating awareness training. Okay. You know, they studied binge eating in the late, since the late 1990s. And, you know, when you're eating mindful based uh, eating, okay, they found that it's the most effective in addressing binge eating, emotional eating, and eating in response to external cues. Okay. They find that it may prevent weight gain, but not enough evidence to say that it's effective for, you know, all of weight management. So we're going to practice. Okay. So what we're going to do is, you know, we're going to take 
you know, just five minutes. Okay. I want you to go to your pantry. You know, you could either press pause or, you know, do whatever you need to do, but, you know, take like three to five minutes and get yourself either, you know, whether it's a grape, a raisin, you know, a, a one pecan, one cashew or an almond. Okay. Those are your choices. Okay. That's all you're getting. Okay. And then, you know, we're going to spend the next, you know, three to five minutes. I'm going through this exercise. All right, so let's practice. So we're gonna use the acronym, you know, LOTS, okay? So first thing is first is I want to know just observing it. Whatever you have in your fingers, whatever you have in your hand, I want you to observe it as if it's the first time you're having it, okay? And just looking at it, what does it look like? You know, is it light? Is it dark? What color is it? Is it round? Is it oval? Is it some sort of, you know, weird shape? Is it a rhomboid, right? And looking at the contours, is it smooth? Does it have a rough surface? Is it wet? Is it dry? Does it have ridges, right? I want you to, you know, just observe it, okay? Second thing is touch, okay? Explore it with your, you know, fingers, okay? And feel the contours, you know, again, you know, does it have ridges? Does is it feel bumpy? Is it sharp, okay? You know, is it the same on both ends? Is it round on both ends? Or is one end different from the other? And, you know, just continue feeling it. Is it rough on your fingers? Is it smooth? Now, the second one is smell. A great rule of thumb is that if you can close your eyes, this would actually work pretty well. So smelling it, what does it smell like? You know, does it swell, smell, you know, sweet? Does it smell dry? Does it smell like, you know, wet? Is there, is there more subtle uh, smells to it? Does it smell nutty? Okay, what does it smell like? And with that smell, you know, smell usually triggers other memories and experiences. Does this trigger something for you? Do you get brought back to a memory of your childhood? Does this remind you of a special occasion? Does this remind you whether you went on vacation or you went hiking or you're just on your, you know, uh, patio or um, balcony enjoying this? You know, does it trigger a certain memory for you? Next one is taste. Now you can actually place this in your mouth, but don't eat it all yet, okay? So place it into your mouth and you probably would start to feel your cheeks squeeze, right? And that's your you know, salivary glands, that's your parotid glands, you know, activating and it's, you know, activating and starting the digestion process and, you know, it's starting to break things down. And that's one of the very first uh, few steps of digestion. So when you're, you know, putting it in your mouth, what do, what do you taste? You know, is it sweet? Is it dry? Is it wet? Right? Is it concentrated sweetness? You know, is it taste like an almond? What does an almond taste like? Right? Is it a cashew? You know, is it what kind of nut do you have? Right? Is it a pistachio? Is it a pecan? Right? You know, what the, can you t describe what those flavors are? right? Or are you just going to tell me it's nutty? Now I want you to pay attention to the, to, to the last one. And then that's listen. So I want you to start eating it and then hear the sounds, closing your eyes, hear the sounds that, you know, um, your, your mouth makes when you're tasting slash eating it, right? Do you hear a crunch? Do you hear it slosh around? Is it making a squishy sound, right? You know, if you have a grape, uh, you know, what do you hear, you know, from it? you know, do you, you know, hear it on one side or do you hear it on both sides of your mouth, right? So I'll let you guys finish that up. And interesting exercise, huh? So that's what I mean about having, you know, more mindfulness um, into, you know, eating and taking things more slowly and pausing. So the next uh, slide we're going to talk about is when you're, you know, next time you have a meal, you know, you're inevitably going to have a rising thoughts, right? And I get this um, as well, where I'm either sipping some coffee or eating a meal is that your mind will start to race. Oh man, I got to change the, the litter box for my cat. I got to go pick up the kids. I got to run them, you know, uh, carry them to the soccer practice. I have to go to groceries. When is Dr. Zhu going to be done with this lecture? You know, there, there's going to be a lot of arising thoughts, you know, with this. And it's important that, you know, when you're enjoying a meal, you want to allow yourself the pleasure and satisfaction of eating. 
Okay. Don't rob yourself. If you guys, you know, there's two categories of people. You either live to eat or you eat to live, right? And if you're like me, you know, you live to eat. And that's, you know, where the enjoyment of food comes into play. So we're coming on to the home stretch. Someone who eats mindfully is someone that acknowledges that there's no right or wrong to eat, but there's varying degrees of awareness surrounding your experience with food. Someone who eats mindfully accepts that their experience is unique. They choose to direct their awareness to all aspects on a moment by moment basis. And they look at the immediate slash direct experiences with their food as opposed to the distant health outcome of that choice. Okay. And someone who eats mindfully is aware and reflects on the effects of mindless eating without judgment. They also reflect on insights on what or how they eat is associated with their specific health goals. And they also become aware of the interconnection of the planet, living things and cultural practices and the impact of the food choices has on these systems. If you had uh, listened to my talks, you know, we talk about how individual health connects to community health and global health as well. So that's where that last bullet comes into play is understanding that not just the interconnection of mindful eating with your own health, but how that connects to outside of you as well. And just a quick tidbit on where we're headed. You know, this is uh, quoted from the Eat Lancet Commission report in 2019. And this report did this amazing gargantuan um, task of trying to come up with a planetary diet that is sustainable, that is, you know, good for our health, uh, that could work in different cultures. And so the Eat Lancet Commission report um, came out. And um, for those of you who want to look more into that, I encourage you to look that up. But basically, I say, quote, unhealthy diets post a greater risk to morbidity and mortality than does unsafe sex, alcohol, drug, and tobacco use combined. Because much of the world's population is inadequately nourished and many environmental systems and processes are pushed beyond safe boundaries by food production. A global transformation of the food system is urgently needed. And according to the United Nations, we're heading towards 10 billion by 2050. And the reason why I bring this up is because uh, we have to keep in, in perspective of where we're going, okay? And so mindful eating is not going to fix all the different types of food issues, climate change, you know, global sustainability issues overnight, but it does uh, help us as another tool and resource to be able to keep in perspective of, you know, where does food come from? You know, how can I enjoy my food, thereby understand where it, you know, came from and how that's going to, you know, uh, take an effect on my body and, you know, my physical body as well as my mental and emotional health body as well. And also, you know, how is that going to affect uh, people outside of me? So that's why I bring this up. So for those here that are of different, you know, roles within the health and wellness industry, I like to give action steps. So if you're a health coach, it does make a difference if you deliver community talks and workshops. If you're a chef, you know, definitely hold workshops and cook more with plants. If you're a physician, give talks, learn to cook, join the professional organization that I'm a part of, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. If you're a community member, cook more with your family members, make family a dinner a thing again, grow your own food and join a urban slash community garden. If you're a healthcare system, be creative with your employees and help patients uh, to save. So those are uh, my usual action steps for people. And these are my suggested resources and references. And last but not least, uh, I told you that, um, you know, I was going to share something special. So if you want to contact me, um, you can find me with that email. I have a new website, uh, thechefdoc.app. It may seem like I have an app and yes, I actually do. <laughs> so, you know, um, we just launched the brand new, uh, the Chef Doc app, which I'm really excited about pretty much about a month ago. For those of you that have been following, I founded the Chef Doc for six years now. Uh, six years ago is when I found it in 2017. You know, we have created many, many different things and it is all under one roof in the ChefDoc app. And we are anticipating on creating more programming for the app as well as uh, creating coaching services um, as well. And so if you want to, you know, 
stay connected, you know, uh, email us if you have a question, check us out on the new website where you could see me as a physician. You know, I give uh, lifestyle medicine consultations and appointments, check out the app. Um, there's a lot of freebies that you can find there um, as well. You can download it on your Apple store or Google play on your Android. And uh, if you want a free gift, take our uh, survey and by clicking on that link below, um, or you can find the survey on the website as well. And if you want to download the app, you can just scan um, that QR code uh, right there on the screen as well. And I want to thank uh, Chef AJ for having me for as a monthly slot. I'm really, really appreciative and really grateful to talk uh, for Chef AJ's audiences again. And until next time, I'll see you um, at the next month. You know, definitely wishing everyone success in their health and wellness journey. And until next time, take care, everyone. Bye-bye.